The last story for today's video tells of three young adults named Noah, Abby, and Lily. They went cage diving and encountered a furious bull shark. Noah, Abby, and Lily were three friends enjoying their summer vacation trip on an island. It was their fourth day, and they all wanted to try exciting things together to make the most of their journey there. Noah suggested they should all go cage diving with sharks, to which his two best friends instantly agreed. The next day, they all inquired at the resort that they were in to go cage diving. The resort staff assisted them and led them to a boat with a scuba diving expert named Danny and another mate named Troy to help them with their cage diving. They all boarded the boat and sailed to a designated section of the sea where they would swim alongside the sharks. Troy provided Noah, Abby, and Lily oxygen tanks and helped them gear up for cage diving. They all secured their scuba gear first and gave instructions. Noah was thrilled to do the activity, while Abby and Lily were nervous. Danny said the cage was too strong for a shark to break into, which immediately calmed them down. When everyone was ready, the three young adults entered the cage and were gradually lowered. The three of them were impressed by the beauty of the fish, coral reefs, and ocean depths as soon as they got in the water. Noah brought his GoPro camera to take footage of their cage diving. Everything was going so well, but the three of them suddenly became bored because the sharks were still not showing up. What comes next after a couple of minutes will forever terrify the three. As unexpected as they thought, a furious bull shark suddenly charged into their cage at a fast speed, causing the cage to shake in the process. Noah dropped his GoPro and was about to reach for it outside the cage when the bull shark charged again and attempted to bite his hand. Luckily, he managed to dodge the sudden attack, yet ended up having a generous cut that released blood into the water, attracting the shark even more. Abby and Lily were now freaking out as the angry shark kept charging and pounding its body to break the cage. When Danny and Troy realized the three were in danger, they immediately operated the boat. Abby and Lily sobbed as they lifted the cage to reveal Noah's hand had been severely injured. They swore to themselves never to go cage diving again. Today's story takes us to the warm beaches of New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Known for its amazing waves, beautiful blue waters, and breathtaking scenery. The beach draws beachgoers and tourists from all over the world to tan, surf, or just hang out at the beach and have a good time. Jet skis, hoverboards, and other small boats pepper the waters along the shore giving it a very charming and amusing appeal to everyone who would come by. But as much as it's a great place to hang out, it comes with its own downsides. The downsides come with rows and rows of sharp, dagger-like teeth and a bite force that could shear a surfboard in half, a creature that lurks in the depths and is a true apex predator. At New Smyrna, they had been declared as the most common creatures to attack. The great white shark, weighing in at over a thousand kilograms and with a body shaped like a torpedo. These creatures have evolved to own the oceans, feeding on whatever they see fit. However, they mainly prefer seafood, but sometimes when humans get a little too close for comfort, things can get a little messy or deadly. Jacqueline, Sarah, Tom, and Brad had taken a small yacht and headed out to the waters off the shore. They had decided to spend two nights out on the water, just off the beach, while they had their fun. They were couples and had decided that a double date on a small yacht out by the sea would be a wonderful idea. Jacqueline had warned them about the sharks, but they seemed to play it down. Come on, Jackie, said Brad. There hasn't been a shark attack here in like a year. There's still a chance, Jacqueline replied. Can we just try something else? You should really stop being a baby, Jackie, said Tom, her boyfriend. This is going to be fine. I'm with you, okay? 
After much goading, she had agreed to head out with them, and soon she had forgotten about all of her worries concerning the sharks. She jumped into the sea with her friends, splashing around and having the time of their lives. The first night passed without incident, and after they were done swimming, they got back in the boat and had their dinner. Some of the leftovers from the steak which they had was thrown overboard into the sea. In all of their fun, they felt safe, not aware of what lurked below. Sharks are able to detect even the slightest vibrations in the waters with the use of their lateral lines, a sensory nerve which runs across their entire body, allowing them to sense vibrations several miles away. A lone female shark hunting some fish picked up on the vibrations caused by Jacqueline and her friends. The hunter turned and headed in their direction, looking to investigate the source of the sound. The shark sensed the sound could come from an injured seal, a delicacy to great whites. An injured one could most likely be free food on the platter. And so the creature bolted through the waters, rushing towards their boat at breakneck speeds looking to catch a good meal. And while Jacqueline and her friends slept, the creature closed in on them. The next morning, they took their time, making out in the small bedrooms assigned to each couple. It wasn't much of a bedroom, just two mattresses on opposite sides of the boat. Afterward, they got out and began celebrating by drinking wine and dancing on the deck of the yacht. Jacqueline danced wildly, deciding not to have as much alcohol as everyone else. As they danced, Brad began turning the boat as they were looking to head back to the beach once they were done for the day. Hey man, any more of that steak left over? Brad asked as he lined up the boat. Yeah, Tom replied, a fair amount. Can I have it? Tom laughed and yelled, yeah bro, catch. Brad turned to see Tom hurl a bit of meat towards the sea. Reacting quickly, he jumped to his feet and launched himself over the side of the boat and into the water, stretching so he could catch the piece of meat. He barely missed it, landing in the water with a huge splash before reaching back up. Damn it! Almost got it, said Brad. Yeah, right, Tom turned to the girls. Anyone who can catch a piece of steak in their mouths gets 500 bucks. As many as you can catch. Keep it going. The game began, and Tom hurled piece after piece out to the water. They jumped after it, trying to catch it, but to no avail. The pieces of meat hit the water and began to spread, and the nearby shark picked up on the scent with its sharp nose. The creature was drawn to the ruckus. It swam closer, following a piece of steak which it saw floating to the bottom. She closed in on it. The great white parted his jaws and ate the meat. Woo! Jacqueline yelled as she caught her piece of steak, munching happily as she opened her mouth to show everyone else. I got it! You got it, Tom asked in disbelief. She swam back to the boat and got aboard, opening her palm for her promised reward. He handed it to her, only for her to push him overboard. Game still on! She turned back and grabbed some of the leftover meat before turning back to her friends. She looked around and raised an eyebrow. Where's Sarah? Brad turned around and realized that the woman who he had heard behind him a second ago was gone. He laughed nervously for a second before putting his head underwater to see if she was purposely hiding from them, looking to play a prank on him. As he put his head down, he spotted something swimming fast underwater. It moved in a straight line at first, before it angled upwards and came right at him. Brad realized that he was face to face with a shark, and it had opened its mouth wide, swimming right up to him. His scream was muffled by the water as his head was under the surface, and a second later, his head was gone, and the rest of his body was catapulted upwards by the speed of the shark. Tom and Jacqueline watched for a second as the body stabilized and began filling the water with blood, and they realized that his head was gone. Tom began swimming for the boat frantically as Jacqueline screamed loudly, paralyzed with fear. Tom reached the boat and grabbed onto the side of it. 
Just as he did, Jacqueline spotted the fin of the shark break through the water, rushing right for them. Before Tom could lift himself out, the creature sank its jaws into his thigh, locking in and pulling, its sharp dagger-like teeth cutting through the flesh, ripping it down to the bone. Tom screamed and held onto the boat for dear life. A shark dragged him, and with his hands gripping the boat, she pulled it along as well, propelling them towards the beach. Jacqueline screamed, reaching out to Tom to offer him a hand, but as she looked into his eyes, she saw a look that terrorized her. He was petrified. The shark stopped pulling, and the sudden stop caused the boat to jerk forward, knocking into the side of Tom's skull, knocking him out instantly, and sending Jacqueline overboard. She fell in and began swimming away, seeing as the boat had continued moving due to the momentum it had. She frantically swam for shore, seeing it wasn't too far away. She screamed, calling out for help as she eventually reached the shore and got the attention of other locals. She made it out alive, but not much was left of the others. The moral of the story is, when the stakes are high, a great white will win. Our third and final story is set in the great state of Florida in the United States. Aside from California, the Sunshine State, Florida, houses some of the most beautiful nature and wildlife, but it also comes with a risk. Animals in Florida tend to be quite aggressive when provoked, which Clyde Millet would find out when he found himself in front of the jaws of a hungry great white shark. For context, Clyde was selected as one of the winners of a complimentary scuba diving course off the coast of Jacksonville. He was a teenager and originally from Jacksonville, so he felt fairly relaxed in the water and jumped at the opportunity immediately. The course was supposed to be held two weeks from the announcement, so Clyde was a little nervous as the team was taking them further away from shore than he had ever been. When the day of the course came, Clyde was sitting in his room contemplating whether he should go. Anxiety and nerves were getting to him, as his mood when he accepted the course had fizzled away, and his head was filled with what-ifs and possible outcomes. His mother, Teresa, urged him to attend the course anyway, since it was a good opportunity to experience something new. He pulled himself together and gathered his things and rushed to the beach as he was late. He got to the meeting point within 20 minutes and was greeted by a familiar sight. A group of six people was standing next to a huge boat, conversing with themselves, but their attention turned to Clyde as one of the instructors raised his arms in the air and exclaimed, There he is! with a smile. As Clyde neared the group, they moved toward him, and one of the instructors slapped him on the pack and asked him if he was late because he was nervous. He nodded and the charismatic instructor told him that everything would be all right, and to make a point, Clyde would be the first to dive that day. This would prove to be a mistake. They made their way to the boat. All in all, there were six of them, two instructors and three people aside from Clyde. One was a middle-aged lady working as a nurse in the nearby hospital. One was college-aged and studying English, and one worked as an accountant in Jacksonville. All of them were eager to head out on the water and enjoy the experience, and they all talked to Clyde in a friendly manner to get him to relax. In the end, he got more comfortable on the boat and was looking forward to his first dive. It took them about 15 minutes to get to their diving point, after which they donned their scuba gear and were ready for the dive. It took Clyde little time to figure out how the suit was supposed to be put on, and the instructor helped him put on his tank and respirator. He talked him through the dive process and what he would do when he got in. Clyde nodded and let himself fall backward into the ocean, with the instructor following him closely. As soon as he was in the water, Clyde opened his eyes to see the deepest blue he had ever seen and the chasm of nothingness he could not have imagined. There was no visible bottom save for some suggestion of a coral reef and flora further than Clyde could see. A hand touched him on the shoulder and he flinched, but he was relieved to see his instructor's face smiling through his respirator. He pointed some ways into the distance, and the two swam there to observe some marine life. The other instructor was tending to the rest of the group individually. 
As they swam forward, visibility improved, and Clyde could finally see the mass of fish and life sprawling through the water. He described it as everything he imagined whenever he thought of the ocean, and said he never regretted seeing it. They swam for a few minutes, taking in the sights, with the instructor looking at Clyde frequently with an I told you so look in his eyes. As the minutes ticked by, Clyde felt more and more free in the water, so he swam deeper and deeper into the depths. The instructor followed him, given his newfound confidence. The marine life bustled the further they dove, but Clyde couldn't shake a feeling of ambiguous unease. He felt as if he was being watched, but couldn't explain it. He turned to the instructor and signaled that he would like them to surface, giving him an enthusiastic thumbs up. They started swimming upwards, but something in Clyde's gut told him to look down. From the murk, a massive shark was swimming through the kelp straight for them. Clyde kicked upwards, jabbing his instructor in the ribs, and then pointed down. His eyes widened, and he firmly grasped Clyde under his arm, and they kicked toward the surface firmly. Clyde did not dare look back until he felt the shark distorting the water around him. It caught up to them. The shark bit into Clyde's leg with everything it had. He accidentally let the respirator fall from his mouth as he tried to let out a scream, and the grimace he made loosened the mask covering his eyes. He was now blind, without air, and being pulled through the water as his legs seared with pain. It quickly subsided, however, since sharks often take hold of their prey and let go to get multiple bites in. The instructor had just caught up when the shark let go of Clyde and surged through the water. He pulled him by the arm and kicked toward the surface with everything he had, leaving a trail of blood in their wake. The boat was getting closer and closer. They managed to surface and Clyde took a massive breath mixed with salt water. Coughing, he took the hands of the other instructor, who had just finished loading the rest of the group into the boat. He fell to the boat's deck and screamed in pain, as the broken bones and severed tendons in his leg shifted, held together only by the skin on his leg. The nurse on the boat tried to patch him up with the first aid kit on the boat, but Clyde was still bleeding. Clyde's instructor barely managed to get back on the boat before the shark's massive maw crashed through the surface after him. As soon as he jumped into the boat, he ran to the engine, steered them toward the shore, and sped up. After that, he knelt beside Clyde and talked to him to ensure he was stable and conscious. He was moaning through the pain, but he would pull through. After an emergency room visit and a few weeks of recovery later, Clyde contacted his instructor again, saying that he didn't blame him for the incident, as it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience he would happily go through again if it meant seeing the ocean in such a scope. He recovered completely and found a passion for deep-sea diving, albeit chainmail was a new mandatory equipment. Wayne Nielsen Our final story is about Wayne Nielsen, a commercial fisherman who had the misfortune of falling in the jaws of a ferocious great white shark on June 6, 2002. His seasonal route dictated that the ship he was on would sail from Kangaroo Island to Neptune Islands and finally arrive at Sleaford. This was a routine journey that Wayne had undertaken many times, so it was nothing out of the ordinary. On the morning of June 5, 2002, Wayne was tasked with handling the maintenance on one part of the ship, which included checking the engine and rotors, but he would also dabble in deckside issues such as netting and the pulley systems. Fifteen years on the job made Wayne the man to ask whenever you needed something fixed, and this day was no different. Just as he had finished his routine engine inspection, he was called to the deck to help the crew figure out why the main pulley system was not pulling the nets from the sea. After a short walk, Wayne made his way to the main deck and found some crewmates clambered around the pulleys trying to make sense of the situation. They cleared the way for Wayne to examine the pulleys and he went straight to work. It took him about five minutes to fix them and he turned around and lifted his hands in a show of expertise. The crew loved Wayne and his personality and they applauded him after the effortless task. The nets were hauled up and the abundance of fish was stirred even more by two fur seals also stuck in the net, fighting over fish, oblivious to the traps they were in. 
The crew laughed and poked the seals with poles to get them back into the water. The day after the seal incident was relatively uneventful, and Wayne went to sleep soundly that night in anticipation of the following day. On the morning of June 6, Wayne went about his daily duties. Everything went smoothly until approximately 3 p.m., when he heard more commotion and went up to the main deck, only to find the crew bickering about the same pulleys he had fixed the previous day. Annoyed that a new crew hand might have tampered with something and put the pulleys out of commission, he marched forward and told them to give him some space. Upon closer inspection of the pulleys, they were under much more strain than before, which caused a mechanical failure that Wayne did not want to explain. As he fiddled with the pulleys, he managed to get them operational again, stood up to test them, and found they worked. Happy with his work, he started back for the lower decks, with the apprentice mechanics asking him what the problem was. As he began explaining the issue, he felt his foot snagged on something. It was a loose rope from one of the main pulleys. At that moment, he realized that one of the ropes was misconnected so that the pulleys had no counterweight, resulting in the loose rope tightening around his ankle under the strain of the fish. As the rope tightened and the entire net of fish came crashing into the sea, Wayne was knocked off balance and pulled across the safety railing into the water. His back seared in pain as he smashed against the water's surface and plummeted down after the net. As his vision stabilized, he realized what was causing all the strain on the net. A massive great white shark was pulling at the net from the water out of the fisherman's sight. The shark zipped around the fish and swam around Wayne, seemingly plotting its intentions. Wayne knew he had to act quickly as he was losing breath and the rope was still snug around his ankle. He pulled a small Swiss army knife from his pant pocket and started slicing at the rope, but it was far too thick for such a small blade to cut. He tried with all his might to slice the rope, and he also tried to loosen it with his hands, but to no avail. He started to panic at this point as he knew the shark was an immediate threat, but he could not see it anymore. In his adrenaline, Wayne was too focused on the rope to notice that the shark was gone and the fish had escaped the net, effectively allowing him to swim to the surface. He had no time to contemplate further actions as his breath steadily ran out. Wayne swam with all his might toward the surface. Even empty, the net proved to be a great hindrance to the mechanic, but he managed to breach the surface and take a refreshing breath, followed by a shout of affirmation to his crew. While some rushed to the lower decks to help Wayne, others stayed up to see if he would surface. As he did, they erupted into relieved cheers. This, however, did not last. One of the young men on the main deck pointed a few yards away from Wayne and told him to swim urgently. As he looked to the side, all he could see was the dorsal fin of the massive shark dip underwater before he felt excruciating pain around the leg the rope was wrapped around. He felt a sudden rush of cold, salty water enter his eyes and throat as he was pulled back under the surface and dragged a few meters away. The pain was horrible but short-lived as Wayne felt the pressure release and he could swim out again. As he breached the surface for a second time, he could see the dorsal fin of the shark darting through the water and away from him, but it turned after a moment and started toward him again. By this point, the crewmates had let down a line for him to hold on to so they could pull him up. All he had to do was reach the line a few yards away from him. He swam with all his might and desperately grabbed the line as his crewmates hoisted him up above the water. The shark lunged at Wayne and held onto the same leg again. Wayne's hand slid down the rope and burned as the shark pulled him back. He screamed in pain as he was being pulled from both sides, with his leg eventually snapping off. The shark disappeared in a red mist under Wayne with its prize, and Wayne was left hanging on the rope for dear life. The crew hoisted him up to the main deck and tended his leg, ensuring the bleeding was staunched. The resident doctor of the ship took care of him as they diverted their course to the nearest port so Wayne could get the care he needed. He made a full recovery as he did not lose too much blood, although the trauma of the incident did leave some psychological scars.
On August 4, 1974, Molly's heart raced with excitement and expectation. She was on a bus heading for a popular aquarium at an undisclosed location in the Midwestern U.S. Her school had booked the trip for the top graduates of her class, and she was one of the lucky ones to be chosen. As she got closer to her appointed seat, her palms started to sweat more and more. She was about to see so many species of fish. The teacher counted the students when they were about to start the trip and gave the driver a nod of approval. The day was beautiful and looked to be enjoyable for everyone. One could sense the enthusiasm in the air. To calm down, Molly sat still and thought about the day ahead. This was the furthest away from home she had ever been, so the positive expectation was overshadowed by anxiety and thinking about things that could go wrong. She resorted to listening to music to pass the time. After about an hour or so, they arrived at the aquarium. Shark's home had opened a few days before their arrival. Marie and Henry, two marine biologists, were the brains behind the idea, as they wanted to bring the youth closer to nature so they could understand the importance of it. They were completely enamored by both the ocean and the life it houses. In fact, they met because of their shared commitment to marine life while researching the same area by chance. The students were welcomed to the aquarium by Marie and Henry, who gave them a tour and introduced them to the different kinds of fish they had. Eventually, they reached the shark tank. Marie started her explanation by saying that sharks are among the most intriguing and misunderstood marine animals. Although they are frequently considered deadly and dangerous, sharks are essential to marine ecology. They are essential to maintaining the ocean's food chain balance. However, several shark species can be fatal to people if they are provoked or if they believe they are their meal. Much to the disappointment of the students at the aquarium, they did not have any of the ferocious shark species they had seen in the movies. Instead, they just had a healthy shiver of black-tipped sharks. Black-tipped sharks are not as large as other species of shark and are usually quite timid unless provoked. They usually reach a size of six feet. Most of the sharks in this tank were about that size, and they were recently moved, adding to their stress. As Molly listened to Marie's fascinating facts, she couldn't help but notice one of her classmates, Jack, looking around airily, not paying attention, even though they had just gotten to the sharks. She asked him if everything was okay, and he said he was fine. He lingered around the sharks as the rest of them went on. It's crucial to realize that, contrary to popular belief, these sharks do not deliberately seek out humans to eat. Most shark attacks result from mistaken identity, in which the shark confuses a human for one of its usual food species, like a seal or a fish. Marie continued her explanations as they went on. Sometimes Henry would step in to get his word, which the students found affectionate and nice. They were captivated by their explanations, oblivious to the horror about to unfurl in front of them. As they got to the coral displays, Marie's gaze lifted from the children and into the distance, followed by a scream. She saw Jack standing on the shark tank, looking down into it. He did not respond to any yells. Molly was horrified by the sight, and her thoughts were identical to everyone else's. They prayed that their friend would not fall into the tank. Just as Marie was within a few yards of the tank, screaming at him to come down, he snapped out of it and looked at her. He lost his footing, and the world seemed to come to a standstill as Jack splashed into the tank, causing the sharks to scatter momentarily before closing in on him. He flailed in the water in panic as the red mist burst all around him. The sharks were agitated, having just been introduced to the tank, and they were also hungry. The sharks bit into Jack one at a time, going for his limbs for the most part. Molly could see him screaming inside the tank and urged Marie and Henry to help him in any way they could. Knowing that getting in the tank was no option, Henry grabbed a pickaxe left over by the building crew the previous day. He slammed the pick into the tank, 
bursting it open at a point. The glass shattered and the water engulfed the area around the tank. Marie urged the kids to back away as the sharks and Jack came out of the tank and onto the ground. The shark's jaws snapped as Henry pulled Jack back to the group. His wounds were deep, but no arteries were hit. The boy was in shock due to the blood loss and the cold water, so they immediately called emergency services while Marie wrapped him up in a blanket from their office. He was responsive and the paramedics managed to arrive on time to take him to the hospital. As the ambulance left the scene, the supervisor of the school group went ballistic at Marie and Henry for their incompetence in maintaining the safety standards of their aquarium. The students were escorted back to the bus to await the police, after which they gave their statements and were on their way. Sharks cannot survive without water for long, so the black-tipped sharks in that tank did not make it. The aquarium was served a hefty fine and faced a lawsuit by the school and the children's parents, which eventually drove them to bankruptcy and the closure of their aquarium. The last Molly heard of them, they worked menial odd jobs where they could. In Jack's case, when asked about his actions that day, he stated that he did not remember climbing onto the shark tank. He pulled through and made a full recovery. The second story tells of a young Australian surfer named Leo Taylor, who miraculously survived an attack from a tiger shark while surfing. Leo is a 19-year-old surfer who is currently at the Gold Coast Beach in Australia to do his most loved hobby of surfing. Since he began surfing, he's enjoyed riding huge and small waves. The waves were huge on this day, so he decided to go surfing. Leo could have continued surfing against gigantic waves for another hour or so. Still, he spotted some dolphins off in the distance and became fascinated by them. Leo decided to stop surfing and sat on his surfboard to watch the dolphins for a while. Being the dolphin lover, he couldn't take his eyes off the dolphins freely roaming the waters. The dolphins were now too far from Leo as he still wanted to see them up close. Leo decided to swim farther away from shore to follow the dolphins. When he got close to the dolphins, he sat down on his surfboard and watched them. Upon watching the dolphins, Leo felt something wrong with the water. He felt as if something big was coming for him from underneath. He was instantly terrified as images of a shark lurking nearby filled his head. With this, he immediately decided to paddle back to shore, which was far away from where he was at sea. As he nervously paddled through the water, a tiger shark charged toward him from underneath, tearing his surfboard apart in two pieces. Luckily, Leo dodged the attack but saw that the shark was now heading toward him next. He decided to swim to the shore, but the shark managed to catch up to him and bit his left arm. Leo screamed in pain as the shark tried to tear his arm off his body. Determined to get away, Leo repeatedly punched the shark's nose with all the strength in his right arm. He also hit the shark in the eye despite the discomfort from the shark's teeth delving deep into his skin. When Leo poked the shark's gills, the shark immediately released his hand and swam away, allowing Leo to swim back to shore as fast as he could. As soon as Leo arrived at the coast, his other surfing mates were shocked to see that his left arm was severely damaged by the shark bite. They then took him to a nearby hospital to sterilize and treat his wound. Coastal waters in the summer are the go-to locations for tourists and divers to go and enjoy themselves, be it on vacation or on a day-to-day -day basis. However, not all vacation destinations are entirely safe, as you have a variety of sea creatures that can kill you with one touch, take entire limbs, and leave you scarred for life. We have three of the most terrifying accounts of everyday people coming across sharks of all species out in the wild, and none have a good outcome. The first story will talk about Max Enfield, a 14-year-old diver who found himself face to face with the greatest terror of the sea, the Great White Shark. Story 1 It was a warm summer day in Cape Town, South Africa and 14-year-old diver Max Enfield was eagerly getting ready to explore the depths of False Bay. 
Max was introduced to scuba diving by his father, Marcin, when he was 10 years old, so he was not short on experience in the water. His father always accompanied him as it was their way of bonding and having fun in their free time. The day that Max's diving career would come to a screeching halt was June 11, 2005, when he would find himself in the ocean's depths with one of the most dangerous predators imaginable, a great white shark. His and his father's day was going quite well, with Max being free from school and his father's job easing up on the workload, giving him more free time. They decided to head for the beach around 11 a.m. and explore some marine life like they always did. They had a tradition of looking for unique shells or anything interesting. Whoever found the best shell wouldn't have to cook dinner when they returned. Max rarely won, but it was the experience that made it worthwhile. As the pair neared their usual meeting point, they spotted a group of novice scuba divers preparing for their first class. They seemed friendly, so Max's father asked them if they could join the class and provide insight into how to get the most out of diving. The nervous novice divers visibly became more comfortable, and the two instructors were happy to take them up on their offer. They made their acquaintance and helped them load the gear onto the boat. The mood was pleasant, and the pair enjoyed spending time with fellow divers. They would take a boat to Seal Island to see some unique wildlife. There were seven people, including Max and his father, and things seemed to be going quite well. Max and Marcin dove into the water first to demonstrate to the group what they have to do, and then they went off to explore while the instructors conducted their lesson. The pair was experienced, true, but they didn't need to all be there to help the newbies. As the pair enjoyed sights like these every week, but it never got old, and each dive was just as amazing as the first. Max looked around, determined to find something impressive to show his father. As his gaze moved along the ocean floor, he spotted something shining at the bottom and thought it would be his best find ever. He pointed to the bottom to Marcin, just so he knew where he would be, to which his father gave him a thumbs up. As Max got deeper and deeper into the water, he felt it getting colder, but he was determined to reach his goal. Through the kelp, he spied the object and reached it after a few minutes. The shine the object was letting off gave him the certainty that he would finally beat his father in their scavenger hunt game. He thrust his hand into the mud and sand and pulled out his prize. It was a piece of glass, a useless piece of glass. He sighed internally and flipped himself over to float in his disappointment. When he opened his eyes again, he was met with a sight that would haunt him forever. The sight of a giant great white shark's maw getting closer and closer to him. He flipped back around in his panic, but the shark was far too fast. Its jaws clamped around his shoulder and the oxygen tank on his back, bursting it. The respirator was blown out of his mouth, and he let out a scream, but it was lost in the water around him. The pain was horrible, worse than anything Max had ever felt. He thought of escaping that situation but the pain inhibited his thoughts. All he could do was wriggle and try to fight off the shark. Just as he was starting to lose consciousness, he saw something surge in front of him, only to see the determined face of his father, who saw what was going on and rushed to Max's rescue. He quickly thrust his hand into the shark's gills to get it to let go of his son, and thankfully it worked. Knowing that time was of the essence, Marcin grabbed Max and started kicking to the surface with everything he had. His legs were burning with the effort, but nothing else mattered except ensuring his son was safe. They left a trail of blood in their wake as they ascended. After about a minute, they breached the surface and both screamed for help, much to the horror of the other instructors explaining the equipment to the new divers. Deathly pale, they hauled Max into the boat and set him down on the deck, with Marcin following closely. He pushed the two men aside and knelt behind Max, who was bleeding. The bleeding was profuse, and Max felt weaker with each passing second. Marcin told the instructors to turn the boat on and rush them to the nearest town, which they immediately did. Marcin put pressure on Max's wounds and used the boat's first aid kit to bandage him as much as possible. They eventually got to shore, and Marcin didn't want to wait for an ambulance, 
so he picked up his son and started running toward the nearby clinic he knew of. After admitting Max to the clinic, he sat in the waiting room with bated breath and never moved his eyes from the door. Eventually, a doctor came out and told him he had arrived just in time. Any more blood loss and Max wouldn't have made it. He was extremely thankful for that and made sure to stay at his son's side until he felt well enough to go home, and he remained at his side for the entirety of his recovery period. Max recovered after a few months, but never recovered emotionally from the ordeal, leading to him dropping diving entirely. Max and Marcin instead took up biking through the countryside as a hobby. Even though that hobby was nothing compared to their love of the sea, the pair agreed that their safety was much more important and that Marcin could not force Max to do something he did not want. Reed, Dante, and Marshall are licensed spearfishers in Australia. They often do spearfishing together for recreational purposes and sometimes to catch fish they'll grill together. They're still young, but they want to go spearfishing all the time as it relaxes them and is a good recreational activity for them. Today, they'll go spearfishing in one of their favorite spots to go spearfishing in Australia. They drove a speedboat to get to their spearfishing site and prepared the gear that they'll be using, their wetsuit, spear gun, diving knife, and their floats. Dante volunteered to be the first to go spearfishing since he loved catching a lot of parrotfish. As soon as he wore all his gear and with his spear gun in hand, he dived underwater and started spearfishing. He was always amazed by the beauty of the coral reefs and fish underwater, which is why he would always go spearfishing. When he sees the parrotfish, he immediately aims his spear gun and fires at the fish, striking it perfectly in the head. Dante swam over to pick up the fish and went out of the water to put it in his float. Reed and Marshall were amazed since Dante was always quick to find a target when they went spearfishing. Dante loads his spear gun and goes underwater again, as minute after minute he catches fish and impresses his friends Reed and Marshall even more. When Dante's float gets slightly filled with fish, he climbs up into the speedboat as it's Marshall's turn now. Just like Dante, Marshall is a professional when doing his thing. He always aims for the biggest fish to fill his float easily. After a couple of minutes, Marshall was done and it was Reed's turn to go spearfishing. Reed was also an expert when it came to spearfishing, and it was not long after this that his float was filled up with fish already. Reed tells Dante and Marshall he's about to go for one last dive before they call it a day. The two agreed as Reed loaded his spear gun and dived underwater to find a fish that he had seen on his last dive. Minutes later, Dante and Marshall were confused about why Reed wasn't coming out of the water yet. The two of them thought that maybe Reed has decided to go a little deeper to catch a big fish, so they just waited for him for a few minutes more. But unfortunately, Reed still wasn't coming out of the water. Dante and Marshall grew worried until Reed suddenly emerged from the water with blood on his arm. Reed screamed at the two as he was waving his arms, one of them bloodied from a bite wound. He told them that a shark was attacking him and he needed to load his spear gun quickly. As he talked, a great white shark emerged from the water and leaped at Reed, tackling his body underwater. Dante and Marshall didn't waste time as they loaded their spear guns and immediately jumped into the water to save Reed. They saw Reed getting bitten by the shark on his torso, trying his best to escape. Reed was punching the shark's face with his bare hands as he screamed underwater in pain due to its teeth getting pierced into his skin. Dante aimed his spear gun at the shark and fired it at its belly. It successfully struck the shark, but it only made things worse. The shark shook Reed's body back and forth in the water as Marshall tried to aim at it again at its belly. As Marshall fired the spear gun, the spear struck the shark's body again making it let go of Reed's body instantly. The two immediately rushed to Reed and carried his body out of the water and into their speedboat. Reed fell unconscious as Marshall did CPR on him while Dante drove the speedboat to the shore. CPR successfully resuscitated Reed and his two friends took him to the nearest hospital. 
The doctors observed several bite wounds and injuries all over Reed's arm and torso, which made him temporarily disabled and need medical help for a long time. After the attack, the officials decided to temporarily ban spearfishing in the area where Reed was attacked to prevent further incidents and aggression in the future. Paige is a young surfer getting ready to compete in her first surfing event the next day. She had been surfing for years with the help of her professional surfer dad, Cohen. Paige and Cohen had been surfing on a beach in Perth, Australia every week, and since then, their father and daughter bond has been closer than before. They often spend their weekends surfing the beach, and even during vacations, they still surf together. Cohen was glad Paige had developed a passion for surfing as much as he did when he was young. Now the two were training together at the beach as Paige would be competing the next day in her first surfing event. She's grown so nervous, but with the help of Cohen, she found the strength to compete against other surfers. She has prepared so much for this event. This is why she's also confident she will win. The following day, Cohen accompanied Paige to the surfing event, which was also held at the same beach where they would often go surfing. Paige sees this as an advantage, as she's used to the sea at that particular beach, boosting her confidence even more. As soon as they arrived at the event, Cohen was greeted by the staff and some authorities there. Paige realized her dad was a famous surfer in his prime, which was amazing for her. Almost every person at the event knew who her dad was, which made her nervous. She doesn't want to fail this event and disappoint her dad. When Paige saw other surfers practicing for the event, she also decided to practice and ride some waves just like the other surfers were doing. Cohen lets her do her thing, letting Paige surf with the others. Paige grabbed her surfboard and started to paddle to the water. Cohen watched as she began to surf and ride the waves going against her way. Cohen noticed his daughter's movement as the staff and authorities who knew him also praised Paige for being skilled like him at such a young age. The other people who came to watch the event also noticed Paige's surfing skills and praised her. They were all looking at Paige riding against the waves like a professional. Cohen and the others were focusing on the surfers, especially Paige, when suddenly Paige fell off the surfboard and into the water. The people gasped, thinking a big wave just threw her off. Cohen watched closely as he expected his daughter to swim and return to her surfboard, but she never did. Suddenly, everyone was alarmed when they saw Paige's arms surface in the water, waving them as a sign she needed help. It turns out that Paige was bitten by a young tiger shark in the leg and was now getting a hold of her body in the water. The shark was underwater when a strong wave hit her and jumped at her without anyone noticing. Paige began to kick the shark with her other leg, but it didn't let go. Paige screamed for help as the other surfers who were surfing with her became afraid and rushed to the shore immediately without daring to help her. Cohen grew worried and ran to the water without hesitation, swimming to save his daughter. Two lifeguards also went into a motorized inflatable dinghy to help rescue Paige from the shark. Meanwhile, Paige could feel the shark's teeth against her skin and blood was already visible in the water when she realized it. She cried out once more for help as she saw Cohen swimming and the two lifeguards on the dinghy coming to save her. Cohen arrived at her first as he kicked and punched the tiger shark's face with his bare hands. Paige held on to him as he kicked the shark's face with all his strength, trying to ward off the shark. He hits the shark's face repeatedly with his feet until the shark gives up and lets go of Paige's leg, leaving her bloody severely. The two lifeguards riding on a dinghy finally arrived and helped Cohen and Paige climb up in the boat before taking them back to the shore. The people at the event were horrified when they saw Paige's severely bitten leg. Cohen tried his best not to cry at his daughter's situation as the authorities decided to take her to the hospital for treatment and cancel the event to prevent further incidents. Paige miraculously survived the attack, but it would take a long time for her leg to heal before she could go surfing again. Today's story takes us to the great ice packs of the Antarctic Ocean, located at the southernmost part of the planet, being the fourth largest ocean on Earth 
the Southern Ocean boosts a wild variety of sights to behold, with ice sheets, icebergs, and extreme temperatures that constantly stay just barely above freezing. Despite the ice-cold temperatures, the ocean boasts a great deal of wildlife, calling it home, from orcas and king penguins to the largest creature on Earth, the blue whale. But of all creatures that live in the Southern Oceans, the one which decided to take an unsuspecting tourist for the thrill of a lifetime was the leopard seal. Charlize and her boyfriend had booked an Antarctic cruise, which would allow them to see the southern parts of the planet for a few days on end. What they had was a romantic time ahead of them, but little did they know that their fates were about to change. Departing from Ushuaia, Argentina, they spent the first day aboard the cruise ship inside, only coming out during the middle of the afternoon when the temperatures were slightly bearable. They took photos of the serene landscape. The ice sheet stretched out for miles in every direction as the ship cruised through the waters. The boat slowed down and allowed some of the tourists to head off and get on one of the sturdier ice sheets. It was large enough to carry 20 people at a time, and Charlize and her boyfriend took their turns, getting on the ice, taking photos with their smartphones. The cold air sucked the heat away from them, but the thrill of being there, along with their clothes, kept them warm. The lifeguard began talking about the history of expeditions to cross the frigid Icelands and everyone who had come before them. But Charlize did not care about that. All she wanted were the photos. Once they were done, they got back on the boat and sailed into a field of icebergs. The tourists marveled at the sights of the icebergs, seeing the large structures bobbing about in the ice, with some of them as small as a person, and the main attraction nearly twice the size of the boat itself. The guard did not let them off, however, as the icebergs were a lot different from the ice sheets and were incredibly unstable. They might look balanced, but they're really not. Sometimes all it takes is a single touch for the balance to get upset, and like a row of dominoes, they'll all come down, the guard explained, pointing to one in the distance. See that one over there? The small one, next to the one with the flat sides. To the left of it, yeah, it might look small, but if you were to take a peek underneath the boat, you'll see that it has the biggest base of any single iceberg in the entire area. So it's a grower, Charlize's boyfriend yelled. The rest of the tourists laughed at his joke as they made their way through the icebergs. By nightfall, they had dinner and the ship picked up speed, looking to circle back quickly by the end of the next day. The next morning was a very important day, the best part of the cruise, according to Charlize. They would have a chance to get off the boat and get into smaller boats and they would be able to get up close and personal with the wildlife. By the morning, they could already see some king penguins on the stretch of ice, some of them diving deep, while the others stood by the shore, staring at the boat. Soon, they were divided into groups that would head out with three boats, which they had inflated and put on the water. The lifeguard had brought some fish with them, which they would use to lure the animals. First, they made their way to the shore, and with a bit of beckoning, they were able to get some of the penguins to come to the sides of the boats, and soon enough, they were eating right out of the palms of their hands. The penguins are one of the most fascinating creatures you'll see out here. Every one of them is a distinct individual with a very wonderful personality. They are also, the guard waited for a moment, incredibly devout lovers. The tourists laughed, along with Charlize, who turned to her boyfriend with a laugh. In the distance, they spotted a penguin who was late for the party. It jumped into the water, and a moment later, it vanished, never popping up on the side. Before Charlize could tell her boyfriend what she had seen, someone yelled something out in Spanish, which she could not understand. No need to be alarmed, they're just seals. They're very friendly, and you could feed them some fish too. Charlize turned back to see the penguins by the boat scatter as a seal swam up to the side of their boat. It looked adorable, and she threw over a bit of fish, and the creature gobbled it up instantly. It raised its head out of the water, and she rubbed its head with a smile on her face, giving it another slice of fish. She turned to her boyfriend, asking him to take a picture, 
as she fed the creature. I'll make a video, he replied, turning the phone to her. Charlize turned and fed the creature another bite. It swam around, watching as she held up a piece in her hand, waiting for her to throw it in. Charlize held it up, taunting the creature, and keeping it in frame as she turned around to see if her boyfriend was getting the video. Just as she turned, she realized that something had grabbed onto her from behind, and before she could speak, she felt herself yanked off the small boat and plunged into the freezing cold water. The sudden change in temperature dazed her, and with her breath suddenly knocked out of her, she found herself breathing in water before she stopped and held her breath. She was being pulled deeper and deeper into the water by something behind her. Turning around, she saw the seal which she had been feeding. It grabbed a hold of her jacket and was trying to take her down, drown her, and then eat her. It was not just any seal. It was a 500-pound leopard seal, a predator in the Antarctic with a hunger for other warm-blooded creatures, as well as seafood. She acted quickly, her mind spurred by the lack of oxygen. In the freezing waters, she took off her jacket, which the seal had taken a bite of. Once free of the jacket, she swam upwards, trying to get back to the surface to get a breath. As she was a fast swimmer, she was able to get back to the surface and gasp for air looking to take one in before she could scream. Then she felt a terrible pain in her leg. Charlize felt herself being pulled back down into the water once again. The seal had taken a bite of her ankle and was now drawing her back underwater. The pain was so intense, as was the shock which her body was going through. She tried to pull away, but the sharp teeth of the leopard seal tore deeper and deeper into her skin causing her to scream underwater, losing all of the air she had kept in her lungs. She bent over, bringing herself closer to the creature as she grabbed its jaws and tried to yank it open. But it was no use. The jaws were too powerful, and the creature had the advantage underwater. Using her other foot, she kicked at the face and snout of the creature, going again and again, as hard as she could until it finally let go. Charlize turned around and quickly began swimming for the surface, but she had already run out of breath. Charlize stopped swimming as she succumbed to the lack of oxygen and slowly began to drown. A moment later, a diver from the cruise ship dropped in and instantly found her floating in the depths and pulled her to the surface. After multiple attempts to resuscitate her, they were finally able to save Charlize. The deep scars on her ankles serve as a reminder to her and everyone who saw that the Antarctic and the creatures who lived there were not to be trifled with, and a seemingly unsuspecting creature like a seal could turn into a murderer in a matter of moments. Our first shark attack survivor is Malia, a 16-year-old surfer from Oahu, Hawaii. Malia is a surfing prodigy in Oahu, Hawaii. She is well known among surfers for her outstanding surfing abilities, which she demonstrated at a young age. She often goes to a famous surfing spot in Oahu to practice every day and attends surfing competitions in which she almost always wins. One day, Malia went to her favorite surfing spot in Oahu to practice for a local surfing competition. The waves in that spot are incredibly huge which she likes about surfing there. It was a hot afternoon, with Malia surfing in the waters with her trainer. Also, her dad, named Makoa, served as a lifeguard to monitor his daughter while surfing. After riding some pretty big waves, Malia swims back to the shore to give herself a little rest. Her dad, Makoa, carried her giant surfboard for her as she changed into another wetsuit to surf again after a few minutes. Be careful, Malia, Makoa said as he gave Malia her surfboard before she went back into the water. Malia paddled her surfboard a few meters away from the shore until she reached the surfing spot and began to ride the first wave. However, both Malia and Makoa are aware of the recent threat regarding Galapagos sharks, one of the most dangerous sharks roaming around Hawaii. Makoa has taught Malia how to deter sharks using her bare hands so he's convinced that his daughter is far from being attacked. Meanwhile, Malia has been happily surfing the big waves simultaneously coming her way. 
She glances at her dad, who was on the shore cheering for her, when the most unexpected happened. While surfing, a shark suddenly pounced on her left leg, causing her to fall off the surfboard. Malia was surprised by the attack, followed by a stinging yet quick bite on her right leg. The waves were big and fast enough to hide the creature attacking her, but she was sure it was a Galapagos shark. Malia was overwhelmed by the waves as the shark kept pouncing on her to take advantage of the situation. When she finally grabbed her surfboard, she used it to shield herself from the aggressive shark and escaped the situation by swimming through the waves. Blood was already flowing from her wounds caused by the shark, but she was determined to survive. When Malia's plan worked, the shark kept pouncing and attacking the surfboard as she subtly swam away and called her father for help. Makoa, who saw what happened and realized that his daughter was still alive, immediately went into the water to rescue her. As soon as they got to shore, Malia was covered in cuts and wounds caused by the shark. She was then carried into a nearby clinic where she was treated and bound to recover from the deadly attack.